Hi. In this lecture, we'll uh, discuss the second aspect of dimension reduction methods, namely distance preserving methods. And we will focus in particular on multidimensional scaling, classic multidimensional scaling, which is a very old method. And then on a newer method from the machine learning literature based on stochastic neighbor embedding. And as before with the PCA, well, I'll uh, present some ways of spatializing these results, of looking at them through a spatial uh, lens, so to speak. Okay, multidimensional scaling. And before I go ahead, I should say I'm um, purposely limiting the technical detail in these slides for extensive discussion and much more technical detail. I refer to the workbook notes. They have all the equations fully spelled out and so on. So first, multidimensional scaling. Um, principle is very intuitive, I think. You um, consider the n observations on k variables as points in a k-dimensional data hypercube. So we've seen this for two variables in a scatter plot, for three variables in a data cube. Just imagine this in general for a hypercube for as many variables as you want. And so these are points floating in space and they are a given distance apart. And so the principle behind the distance preserving methods is to preserve these relative distances by embedding the points in a lower dimensional space. So they're called embedding methods and typically this lower dimensional space is two dimensional or three dimensional because then we can see it. Um, Geoda has both. The whole point is to preserve the relative distances. And so then close points in multi attribute space become close points embedded in the lower dimensional spaces. And those are the natural interpretation of clusters, which will um, pursue in uh, later modules. So the idea is we have the points high dimensional space. How do we get them in a lower dimensional space such that their distances are respected? And so first we need to define a measure of distance and then we need to define an, obje an uh, objective function or goal for this analysis. So the distance the most general distance is Euclidean distance. It's simply the um, square root of the sum of square deviations. So the squared differences for each variable h between two locations, two observations, i and j, that is the Euclidean distance. Um, in two dimension is simply the square root of the sum of two squared differences, x i minus xj squared plus yi minus yj squared and then the square root out of that. Uh, we can also represent it in vector notation where the square difference between two observations, two locations is this uh, in internal cross product of their differences. So that's the say traditional distance, Euclidean distance based on squares of the differences. An alternative is the Manhattan difference, which is Manhattan distance, which is based on absolute differences. So Manhattan dif distance has a less influence of outliers. Since the Euclidean distance is based on square differences, the larger differences get overemphasized and that's less the case with the Manhattan distance. So that's our distance metric. We've seen this a couple of times before. Then the second thing is, what is the objective function? And the objective function is, I mean, the, the goal is to find coordinates in the lower dimensional space. And let's call them Z1 through Zn. So for each observation, we have a new set of coordinates in the data space say for two dimensional, multi dimensional scaling, there would be an X and a Y coordinate for three dimensions, you would have three coordinates. 
And so we have to find these new z coordinates such that the difference with the original difference is as small as possible. And this is expressed in what is called a stress function. For every pair of observations, we have the difference between the original distance in the higher dimensional data cube and the distance computed for the new coordinates. So what is the unknown here? The unknown is z. We have to find coordinates in the lower dimensional space. To, with these coordinates corresponds a distance in the lower dimensional space. And so we're trying to minimize the square difference between the original distance and the distance in the lower dimensional space. Importantly, the square will again emphasize the larger distances. So the stress function, that's what it's called, penalizes large discrepancies more. So it will it'll tend to preserve these large distances more than smaller distances. That's um, what happens. So we'll consider two different um, ways to deal with this. Um, in one, one uses the stress function, the other one is a little more modern and doesn't use a stress function, uses a, a different measure of fit between the original distances and the uh, new distances for the new uh, points. So the uh, multi classic multidimensional scaling actually goes back uh, quite a ways in the uh, lab notes. You get some detail about the history of multidimensional scaling. And a very important concept in this context is what is called the Gram matrix. Remember when we talked about principal components, we used the covariance matrix, which is X prime X, which was of the dimension of the number of variables, the number of the original number of variables. In multidimensional scaling, we use X times X prime, which is, of course, of dimension n by n, which is the dimensionality of the number of observations. And each element in this Gram matrix is the sum of the cross products for all the variables. So it's actually a very simple thing. You see here, um, so n times k, k times n. So the each of the um, for a given observation, each variable is multiplied with the matching observation uh, for the um, other observation, uh, the, the matching variable for the other observation. So for two observations, i and j, it's a product of each matching variable h. So the first variable for i times the first variable for j the second variable for i times the second variable for j, and we add this all up. This is expressed succinctly in this matrix x, x prime, which is called the Gram matrix. So a very um, fundamental equivalence that is exploited, and uh, the details are given in the notebook, are that the Gram matrix x, x prime is actually equivalent equal, identical, to the square distance matrix that is manipulated. Manipulated in the following sense, um, multiplied by this matrix operation, which is a, a way of succinctly, succinctly expressing deviations from the mean. So we carry out the deviations from the mean twice, once applied, if you wish, on the rows, once applied to the columns, and after this double centering of the square distance matrix, not, not the distance matrix, it's square, and we take the negative and half of it, then we actually have exactly the same as this matrix x prime x. In other words, we don't need the actual x matrix as long as we have distances, and specifically square distances, we can do the multidimensional scaling. Now, why is this important? The early uh, literature on multidimensional scaling 
came from psychology, from psychometrics, where it was easier to compute distances based on certain tests than to have the actual observations of the matrix. So the essence of this fundamental equivalence is that it doesn't matter. As long as you have the square differences, then by double centering it and, and rescaling, you essentially have the same as this matrix X prime X, uh, X, X prime, I should say. So N by N matrix. Now, why is this important? Because we have our friend, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors again. And we can, just like with principal components, we carried out a spectral decomposition of the covariance matrix. Here, we're going to carry out a spectral decomposition of the gram matrix. Now, the difference is very important because with principal components, we ended up with a K by K matrix. So the eigenvectors were of dimension K and the, you know we had K eigenvalues. Here, we're operating on a square matrix of dimension N by N, where N is the number of observations. So we get uh, N eigenvalues and the dimension of each eigenvector is N as well, which actually comes out pretty handy because that matches the number of observations. And we're just going to do a little bit of matrix hocus pocus, as I like to call it. And we start with the spectral decomposition of XX prime. And so that's, this is the N by N matrix where each column is an eigenvector of dimension N. This is an N by N diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues and this is the transpose of the eigenvectors. Now, since this is a diagonal matrix, we can take its square root. And uh, the square root of a di diagonal matrix is also diagonal. So if we take these two square roots, then this is the same. Writing this is the same as writing this. But now we can group these two parts together. And since the transpose of a di diagonal is the same as the diagonal, we actually have two new uh, matrices of pseudo observations, namely V times G square root and V times G square root prime. So the X in here is replaced by V G square root and the X prime is replaced by its prime. Why is this important? Because these two expressions are exactly the same. But here, X is in our original coordinate system, if you wish, and V, G is kind of a rotated coordinate system, a rotated axis system. Now, as such, this is not really that useful because here we have n observations for p variables. Here we also have n observations for p variables. And this is where the dimension reduction part comes in, just as with principal components, where we had initially as many principal components as we have variables, but then we cut them down to the most important ones. Here we start with as many vectors in here as we had originally, but we cut them down by taking the first two or three vectors of this big matrix. This is an N by N matrix. So the way to get the new coordinates in this embedded space, lower dimensional space, is we get XX prime or we get it from the distances. It's the same thing. We do the eigenvalue decomposition, we get the eigenvectors, and we multiply each eigenvector by the square root of the matching eigenvalue. And do those give us the coordinates in the two or three dimensional space. And just to illustrate how this works, using the same example as before, uh, as we used for principal components with the Gary data, um, 
These are the first five observations on the first two eigenvectors. These are the matching eigenvalues. This is the square root of the eigenvalue. So the new coordinates, the new values on the two coordinates in the two-dimensional space are obtained by multiplying each of these by the square root of the eigenvalue. So this value here, minus 2.15, is the product of minus 0.16 times the square root of the eigenvalue. And just as before, we have to uh, watch out for the signs because the signs of the eigenvectors can flip depending on which method we use. So this is pretty straightforward. It gives us a new an embedding of the, in this example, six-dimensional data cube onto two dimensions, and each point has an x and a y coordinate. And what this means is that points that are close together in two-dimensional space should also be close together in the six-dimensional space, or vice versa, rather vice versa. So when uh, points are together in six-dimensional space, they should also be together in two-dimensional space. In other words, they form what we call clusters. We'll uh, elaborate on that later. So this is a two-dimensional MDS plot as produced by Geoda. It has two uh, statistics on how well this does, these are really relative values. Here's the stress value, that's the objective function. We'd like to see this as small as possible. And this is a rank correlation between the distances in six-dimensional space and the distances in the new two-dimensional space. That's another measure of fit of the lower dimensional distances to the higher dimensional distances. Um, we can do this, as I mentioned in Geoda, in two dimensions or in three dimensions. However, having close neighbors in two dimensions doesn't mean that they're necessarily close in three dimensions. So we see that this can be quite different. So of course, the fit is going to be better in three dimensions, but then the dimension reduction is not as good as going to two dimensions. So typically the preferred dimensionality is two dimensions and then we interpret closeness in the two dimensions as also close in the higher dimensional uh, data cube. Okay, that is the classic multidimensional scaling method. It is based on eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Now, in contrast to principal components, where the dimension of the covariance matrix was actually fairly small, easy to manage, here, the dimension of the Gram matrix is n by n, is as, as many as there are observations. And as it turns out, uh, as we know, the um, solution of eigenvectors and eigenvalues is not an analytical solution, but is based on a computational approach. And as it turns out, that computational approach starts to not work very well for very large matrices. Typically, once you hit a couple of thousand observations, then the eigenvalue computation is not uh, very um, precise. There are ways around it. The power approximation, which is detailed in the lab notes, is a way to compute only the largest eigenvectors. And since we only need the first two, um, that's actually a way around this problem. But there is an, another issue, is that <coughs> this um, decomposition of the Gram matrix only works for Euclidean distance. And in many applications in psychology and psychometrics, the distances are actually not Euclidean, but are any other valid distance metric. And so there's an alternative optimization method that it's still based on the stress um, function, the, dis the difference between the distance in the two, the distances in the two dimensions. But this alternative optimization is actually kind of a, an iterative procedure. It's a heuristic. It's something that gets close uh, 
to the optimal solution. And it's known by the acronym SMACOF or SMAKOF, and which stands for scaling by majorizing a complex function. And this is, all sounds maybe very complicated, but it's actually a fairly straightforward principle. And the principle is iterative, so we get better and better as we proceed, uh, majorization. And majorization is approximating a complicated function by a simple function that is easy to minimize. And the idea is that we kind of uh, find the best solution for the simpler function and that's close or close enough to the complicated function we are trying to optimize. And this is uh, expressed in the so-called sandwich inequality. So we have our original complicated function is f, our simpler function is g. We know that g, g can be set equal to f, that's a good thing. And we can uh, optimize g, finding the minimum for g. And we know that that minimum for g, which is a lot easier than the minimum for f, will be close to and ideally equal to the minimum for s. So the sandwich inequality is kind of shows how we, uh, by minimizing this um, auxiliary function, the helper function, we get very close to the actual uh, minimum for the original complicated function because the stress function is highly nonlinear and very complicated. And this kind of graph borrowed from a textbook illustrates this, I think, very nicely. So. The original function f, the complicated one, is the highly nonlinear one here. And what we're doing is we're approximating that by a parabola. Parabola is a very easy function to minimize. And we can use the parabola because we can set the parabola equal to the um, complication, complicated function at, at a particular point. So we have the tangent of the parabola to the original function. And then once we have this auxiliary function, we can minimize it. And this minimum gives us a new point. And the new point also gives us a new point of the tangent for the parabola. So we have the parabola again. We have a new minimum point. And as we repeat this process, we get closer and closer to the actual minimum of the complex function. So that's iterative majorization. So what is the million dollar question is what is this auxiliary function g that we use to approximate our complicated function, the stress function. And this is <clears throat> fairly complex. And as I mentioned earlier, I will spare you the mathematical details in these slides, but they are all spelled up, spelled out in uh, the uh, lab notes. And the critical step is what is called the so-called Goodman transform. And the Goodman transform uh, allows us to transition from a given solution, a given solution which consists of coordinates, x and y coordinates, to a new solution, an improved solution, by carrying out this transform using this n by n matrix B. And the n by n matrix B is a function of the coordinates, the initial coordinates. So the matrix is n by n. The off-diagonal elements, B, i, j, consists of negative delta i, j, which is the original distance in the high dimensional space. So that doesn't change. But this, the denominator, the, the d, i, j, is a function of the particular coordinates that we pick in y. So the off-diagonal elements are the this negative ratio. The diagonal elements are the sum of all the row elements of the, all the off-diagonal row elements. So we, we have this matrix. So we, we pick coordinates. We stick them in here. That gives us a set of distances dij. We combine these in a ratio with the original distances, carry out this transformation, 
and have a new solution. So this critical step, which comes out of a lot of algebra using this majorization principle, yields us an algorithm. We start by picking a set of random starting values and set y to these values. Then we compute the stress fu function where we are. Then we go to our Goodman transform with our coordinates in y and with the distances based on the coordinates in y we get a new set of coordinates for z and compute the stress function. And as long as the stress function improves enough we keep going. This is a very easy iterative solution. We keep going up until we find that the improvement is good enough when the change is smaller than a preset difference and then we stop. So this is the essence of this makeoff algorithm. It gives the same solution, I mean it gives a similar solution in the sense it also gives us x and y coordinates for a, a two-dimensional uh, representation. Um, as I mentioned before, what is the interpretation of multidimensional scaling is that um, points that are close are close in both spaces. So if they're close in the high dimensional data cube, they're also close in the two dimensional data space. Um, keep in mind that multidimensional scaling, both the classic and the Smekov uh, type, um, don't do too well on close neighbors, but do very well on uh, uh, neighbors that are further apart, uh, which aren't actually neighbors, points that are further apart. And what do we use this for? As I mentioned already, points that are close together are called clusters. So we look for interesting groupings in the 2D points. And we can use this later on. We'll see how we can use this in cluster analysis. So. In essence, we are uh, trying to assess whether points that are close in two-dimensional space, and we can uh, again visualize this using our parallel coordinate plot, which has the six dimensions visualized in two dimensions, and uh, data points in high-dimensional data cubes are expressed as a line in this PCP, so uh, we can check by linking and brushing the extent to which points that are close in the multidimensional two-dimensional space are also close lines in the parallel coordinate plot and vice versa. And we can of course turn this around and look at points that are far apart in multidimensional two-dimensional MDS space whether they're also very far apart as lines in the parallel coordinate plot. So that's the straightforward classic interpretation of the results of a multidimensional scaling exercise. This, uh, the objective function is to minimize the stress function, which is the square difference between the original distances and the distances in the new space, this new two-dimensional space. Okay. This is fine, as I mentioned, um, primarily for larger distances, but it's not so good for close distances. And in a lot of applications, we're actually much more interested in close neighbors than in uh, distance neighbors, which aren't neighbors. Uh, and that's where this method of stochastic neighbor embedding comes from, SNE. So the stochastic neighbor embedding is the same idea, the same goal as multidimensional scaling, namely finding an embedding of the data points in a lower dimensional space, but it's not based on the stress function. Instead, it's based on a notion of differences between probability distributions, and it's a measure of fit. And those of you who've taken Bayesian statistics will recognize the click or the Kohlberg Leibler information criterion, which is a measure of fit between two sets of probabilities. And the key step in stochastic neighbor embedding is to translate the neighbor relationship, 
in both the high dimensional space and the low dimensional space into a probability, into a stochastic notion. And the notation is the, uh, this is not a distance, this is the probability that J is a neighbor of I in the high dimensional space is expressed as P and the same notion in the low dimensional space is uh, expressed as Q. Now the difference between P and Q is that we know P and we don't know Q. Q depends on these coordinates, the Z as we have used as notation, in the low dimensional space. So we figure out a way to compute probabilities of J being a neighbor of I in the high dimensional space, which we know, we find its counterpart in the low dimensional space, which we don't know. We try to find um, uh, coordinates that yield these QIJs that are as close as possible to the PIJs in some probabilistic sense using the click criterion. Okay. Again, this is pretty technical. The details are given in the lab notes. Uh, the essence is that we have to figure out a way of translating distances between points into probabilities. So for the known distances, the D, between the actual observations in high dimensional uh, data cube, we use a Gaussian kernel, the exponential of the inverse square dif distances divided by a variance. And the variance is very important this is the same notion as a bandwidth in the kernel uh, density functions that we saw before. And the bandwidth is related to a, a, an, a concept that is used in this context of perplexity. And in essence, perplexity has to do with how many neighbors you're willing to consider. So the perplexity translates in practical terms into picking a variance, a notion of bandwidth for this kernel. This is uh, essentially a kernel smoother that finds the conditional probability that j is a neighbor of i based on the distances between i and j in high dimensional space and we make this symmetric by um, this operation. So then we have our pij. Now we have to do the same thing in our low dimensional um, data space which depends on the new unknown uh, coordinate z. Again, our purpose is to solve this for z. And then with this unknown z's, we using the distance between them, we get the qij measure, which is based on a t distribution. Hence the notation t SNE. That's where it comes from. So we have our p distribution and our q distribution. Now, our objective function is to find the coordinates z that yield the probabilities q i j that are as close as possible in a probabilistic sense to the known p i j. And the um, kullback leibler information criterion is the sum, and this may remind you of measure of entropy, is the sum of the uh, product of the pij with the log of the ratio between pij and qij or you can also write this as pij log pij this is known minus PAG, pij log qij this is known pij is known log qij depends on the unknown z coordinates and the gradient, which we use in the optimization, is a complex function that depends both on the known PIJ, they don't change, but on the unknown QIJ, which are also a function of, these are a function of the coordinates, but then there's another element to this, which is a function of all the coordinates, see the sum over all the other coordinates relative to a given location i. So uh, this is a very complicated function. As I said, the details are in the lab notes. In practice, the optimization is an iterative process that starts with 
just like before with a random starting point. It uses the gradient which optimizes moves in the right direction but it doesn't take the full gradient. It has a learning rate which is um, doesn't really allow for the full gradient in order not to overshoot the optimum. There also is a momentum term which is a function of the changes that are induced in these coordinates. Again, this is all part of the process of not trying to overshoot the um, solution. And then indirectly involved is this involved in the um, computation of the PIJs is this perplexity notion which is translated into the bandwidth or the variance, if you wish, of the kernel smoother that is used to um, compute a PIJ. So this is what's going on in the background. We have uh, changed our notion of distance into a notion of probability, PIJ. We have this notion of probability both in the high dimensional space, known, P, and in the unknown space, Q, which depends on the coordinates Z that we need to find. And how do we find this? This is actually a very cool iterative algorithm. And if everything works properly, I will be able to show you, oh, it didn't work properly, um, show you the, the movie. There we go. So you see each of these iterations is a new set of Z coordinates in two dimensions. And you see this is jumping around, jumping around uh, for a while. And around uh, 300, it starts to spread out a little bit. And then around 500, you will see that it starts to stabilize. And there are only very minor adjustments. Here we are pretty stable and we're pretty much done. So um, I think a very cool algorithm um, I could show it again. So we start with the initial solution, which is random. Then we jump around a lot, but things stay pretty close together until we reach a particular point where we're able to push the points out. And then we pull them back, see them being pushed out, and then they get pulled back together again. And this iteration is all a function of an interplay between the gradient, the learning rate, and the, uh, the different um, parameters of adjustment of the optimization process. So just to uh, recall the learning rate, the momentum, and then the variance of the process. So, um, so this gives us um, TSNE, the same kind of solution as multidimensional scaling. We end up with a two-dimensional space with coordinates in this two-dimensional space. We just find the coordinates in a different way. So uh, as with principal components, the spatial take on this is something unique to this class, uh, fairly unique. Um, so what we are trying to do, and um, you may recall this principle from the intro spatial data science class, when we looked at spatial autocorrelation, which was all about matching attribute similarity with locational similarity. Now we have a very concrete expression in a high dimensional situation of attribute similarity, nam namely the uh, closeness of observations in the low dimensional space. So the translation of the match between attribute or the mismatch as the case may be between attribute and locational similarity is the match or mismatch between neighbors in our two-dimensional space either from multi-dimensional scaling or from TSNE and neighbors in geographic space and we can exp uh, explore this by linking and brushing and we can also explore this more uh, um, formally by our local neighbor match test, which you may remember from the previous class. And so uh, very exploratory, we can uh, select neighbors in multidimensional space. Uh, 
and assess the extent to which they are also neighbors in geographic space. And as we see, this is not always the case. So we link and brush, rather we brush in the two-dimensional uh, MDS space and we find the neighbors on the map and we can flip it around and do geographic brushing on the map and find out the extent to which these observations are neighbors in multidimensional space. So this is simply exploratory linking and brushing, um, you know, making concrete this notion of the mass match or mismatch between geographic neighbors and neighbors in attribute space. And then finally, we can look at the extent to which regions in geographic space are matched by regions in multidimensional space. Actually, uh, as you work through the lab notes, you would see that this is an option in the TSNE uh, algorithm. And then finally, we have our local neighbor match test, which find the extent to which the nearest neighbors overlap in two-dimensional, in this case, TSNE space, and in geographic space. So the red bars are the neighbor, the nearest neighbor relations and that are matched in both spaces. And those dark green locations are the locations where there is a close match between the nearest neighbors in geographic space and the nearest neighbors in TSNE space, which is a simplification of the original local neighbor match test which pertained to the full high dimensional space. <clears throat> so this concludes my discussion of distance preserving methods. We saw um, two kinds, one which was really more focused on the larger distances, multidimensional scaling. We saw the classic approach based on eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And then we saw an iterative, an iterative approach uh, to minimize this stress function, which is the square difference between the original distances and the new distances, and through the Smackoff uh, algorithm, the iterative majorization, which was kind of a cool way to get at this. The advantage of Smackoff is that we don't need Euclidean distances, so as long as we have a proper distance metric, no matter where it comes from, uh, we're in business. And then TSNE, which stands for Stochastic Neighbor embedded, Embedding, replaces, if you wish, the stress function by a probabilistic stress function equivalent, the Kluge-Kullberg Leiber information criterion, which uh, rather than working with distances, we work with probabilities. Of course, the probabilities are related to distances for the ori original high dimensional attribute space they're related to the original distances through a Gaussian kernel function. And for the unknown low dimensional space, they're computed from a T distribution function based on the distances in there. So we have these two sets of probabilities, and then we try to find the closest match between them, which is kind of a cool, um, but very complicated algorithm, which ends up both MDS and TSNE and SNE give us points that are observations in a lower dimensional space. Then we can assess whether neighbors in this low dimensional attribute space are also neighbors in geographic space. And we can apply clustering algorithms to them as well. And clustering is the subject of the next module. First, we start with the classic clustering methods. This come next. See you then.